Section One of In the Midst of Life: Tales of Soldiers and Civilians, 1891. The Suitable Surroundings. The Night. One midsummer night, a farmer's boy living about ten miles from the city of Cincinnati was following a bridle path through a dense and dark forest. He had been searching for some missing cows, and at nightfall found himself a long way from home and in a part of the country with which he was only partly familiar. But he was a stout-hearted lad, and knowing his general direction from his home, he plunged into the forest without hesitation guided by the stars. Coming into the bridle path, and observing that it ran in the right direction, he followed it. The night was clear, but in the woods it was exceedingly dark. It was more by the sense of touch than that of sight that the lad kept the path. He could not indeed very easily go astray. The undergrowth on both sides was so thick as to be almost impenetrable. He had gone into the forest a mile or more, when he was surprised to see a feeble gleam of light shining through the foliage skirting the path on his left. The sight of it startled him, and set his heart beating audibly. The old breed house is somewhere about here, he said to himself. This must be the other end of the path which we reach it by from our side. Ugh! What should a light be doing there? I don't like it." Nevertheless he pushed on. A moment later, and he had emerged from the forest into a small open space, mostly upgrown to brambles. There were remnants of a rotting fence. A few yards from the trail, in the middle of the clearing, was the house from which the light came through an unglazed window. The window had once contained glass, but that and its supporting frame had long ago yielded to missiles flung by hands of venturesome boys, to attest alike their courage and their hostility to the supernatural. For the breed house bore the evil reputation of being haunted. Possibly it was not, but even the hardiest skeptic could not deny that it was deserted which in rural regions is much the same thing. Looking at the mysterious dim light shining from the ruined window, the boy remembered with apprehension that his own hand had assisted at the destruction. His penitence was, of course, poignant in proportion to its tardiness and inefficacy. He half expected to be set upon by all the unworldly and bodiless malevolences whom he had outraged by assisting to break alike their windows and their peace. Yet this stubborn lad, shaking in every limb, would not retreat. The blood in his veins was strong and rich with the iron of the frontiersman. He was but two removes from the generation which had subdued the Indian. He started to pass the house. As he was going by, he looked in at the blank window space and saw a strange and terrifying sight, the figure of a man seated in the center of the room at a table upon which lay some loose sheets of paper. The elbows rested on the table, the hands supporting the head, which was uncovered. On each side the fingers were pushed into the hair. The face showed pale in the light of a single candle a little to one side. The flame illuminated that side of the face, the other was in deep shadow. The man's eyes were fixed upon the blank window space with a stare in which an older and cooler observer might have discerned something of apprehension, but which seemed to the lad altogether soulless. He believed the man to be dead. The situation was horrible, but not without its fascination. The boy paused in his flight to note it all. He endeavored to still the beating of his heart by holding his breath until half suffocated. He was weak, faint, trembling. He could feel the deathly whiteness of his face. Nevertheless, he set his teeth and resolutely advanced to the house. He had no conscious intention. It was the mere courage of terror. He thrust his white face forward into the illuminated opening. 
At that instant a strange, harsh cry, a shriek, broke upon the silence of the night, the note of a screech owl. The man sprang to his feet, overturning the table and extinguishing the candle. The boy took to his heels. THE DAY BEFORE Good morning, Colston. I am in luck, it seems. You have often said that my commendation of your literary work was mere civility, and here you find me absorbed, actually merged, in your latest story in The Messenger. Nothing less shocking than your touch upon my shoulder would have roused me to consciousness. The proof is stronger than you seem to know, replied the man addressed. So keen is your eagerness to read my story that you are willing to renounce selfish considerations and forego all the pleasure that you could get from it. I don't understand you, said the other, folding the newspaper that he held and putting it in his pocket. You writers are a queer lot, anyhow. Come, tell me what I have done or omitted in this matter. In what way does the pleasure that I get, or might get, from your work depend on me? In many ways. Let me ask you how you would enjoy your dinner if you took it in this streetcar. Suppose the phonograph so perfected as to be able to give you an entire opera, singing, orchestration and all, do you think you would get much pleasure out of it if you turned it on at your office during business hours? Do you really care for a serenade by Schubert when you hear it fiddled by an untimely Italian on a morning ferry-boat? Are you always cocked and primed for admiration? Do you keep every mood on tap, ready to any demand? Let me remind you, sir, that the story which you have done me the honor to begin, as a means of becoming oblivious to the discomfort of this street-car, is a ghost story. Well? Well, has the reader no duties corresponding to his privileges? You have paid five cents for that newspaper. It is yours. You have the right to read it when and where you will. Much of what is in it is neither helped nor harmed by time and place and mood. Some of it actually requires to be read at once, while it is fizzing. But my story is not of that character. It is not the very latest advices from Ghostland. You are not expected to keep yourself au courant with what is going on in the realm of spooks. The stuff will keep until you have leisure to put yourself into the frame of mind appropriate to the sentiment of the piece, which I respectfully submit that you cannot do in a street-car, even if you are the only passenger. The solitude is not of the right sort. An author has rights which the reader is bound to respect. For specific example, the right to the reader's undivided attention. To deny him this is immoral. To make him share your attention with the rattle of a street-car, the moving panorama of the crowds on the sidewalks, and the buildings beyond, with any of the thousands of distractions which make our customary environment, is to treat him with gross injustice. By God, it is infamous! The speaker had risen to his feet and was steadying himself by one of the straps hanging from the roof of the car. The other man looked up at him in sudden astonishment, wondering how so trivial a grievance could seem to justify so strong language. He saw that his friend's face was uncommonly pale, and that his eyes glowed like living coals. "'You know what I mean,' continued the writer impetuously, crowding his words. You know what I mean, Marsh. My stuff in this morning's messenger is plainly subheaded a ghost story. That is ample notice to all. Every honorable reader will understand it as prescribing by implication the conditions under which the work is to be read. The man addressed as Marsh winced a trifle, then asked with a smile, What conditions? You know that I am only a plain businessman who cannot be supposed to understand such things. How, when, where should I read your ghost story? In solitude, 
at night, by the light of a candle. There are certain emotions which a writer can easily enough excite, such as compassion or merriment. I can move you to tears or laughter under almost any circumstances. But for my ghost story to be effective, you must be made to feel fear, at least a strong sense of the supernatural, and that is a different matter. I have a right to expect that if you read me at all, you will give me a chance, that you will make yourself accessible to the emotion which I try to inspire. The car had now arrived at its terminus and stopped. The trip just completed was its first for the day, and the conversation of the two early passengers had not been interrupted. The streets were yet silent and desolate. The housetops were just touched by the rising sun. As they stepped from the car and walked away together, Marsh narrowly eyed his companion, who was reported, like most men of uncommon literary ability, to be addicted to various destructive vices. That is the revenge which dull minds take upon bright ones in resentment of their superiority. Mr. Colston was known as a man of genius. There are honest souls who believe that genius is a mode of excess. It was known that Colston did not drink liquor, but many said that he ate opium. Something in his appearance that morning, a certain wildness of the eyes, uh, an unusual pallor, of thickness and rapidity of speech, were taken by Mr. Marsh to confirm the report. Nevertheless, he had not the self-denial to abandon a subject which he found interesting, however it might excite his friend. "'Do you mean to say,' he began, "'that if I take the trouble to observe your directions, place myself in the condition which you demand, solitude, night, and a tallow candle, you can, with your ghastliest work, give me an uncomfortable sense of the supernatural, as you call it? Can you accelerate my pulse, make me start at sudden noises, send a nervous chill along my spine, and cause my hair to rise?" Colston turned suddenly and looked him squarely in the eyes as they walked. "'You would not dare. You have not the courage,' he said. He emphasized the words with a contemptuous gesture. You are brave enough to read me in a street car, but in a deserted house, alone, in the forest, at night? Ah, I have a manuscript in my pocket that would kill you. Marsh was angry. He knew himself a man of courage, and the words stung him. If you know such a place, he said, take me there tonight, and leave me your story and a candle. Call for me when I've had time enough to read it, and I'll tell you the entire plot and kick you out of the place." That is how it occurred that the farmer's boy, looking in at an unglazed window of the breed house, saw a man sitting in the light of a candle. THE DAY AFTER Late in the afternoon of the next day, three men and a boy approached the breed house from that point of the compass toward which the boy had fled the preceding night. They were in high spirits, apparently. They talked loudly and laughed. They made facetious and good-humored ironical remarks to the boy about his adventure, which evidently they did not believe in. The boy accepted their raillery with seriousness, making no reply. He had a sense of the fitness of things, and knew that one who professes to have seen a dead man rise from his seat and blow out a candle is not a creditable witness. Arriving at the house and finding the door bolted on the inside, the party of investigators entered without further ceremony than breaking it down. Leading out of the passage into which this door had opened was another on the right and one on the left. These two doors also were fastened and were broken in. They first entered at random the one on the left. It was vacant. In the room on the right, the one which had the blank front window, was the dead body of a man. It lay partly on one side, with the forearm beneath it, the cheek on the floor. The eyes were wide open. 
the stair was not an agreeable thing to encounter. An overthrown table, a partly burned candle, a chair, and some paper with writing on it were all else that the room contained. The men looked at the body, touching the face in turn. The boy gravely stood at the head, assuming a look of ownership. It was the proudest moment of his life. One of the men said to him, "'You're a good un,' a remark which was received by the two others with nods of acquiescence. It was skepticism apologizing to truth. Then one of the men took from the floor the sheets of manuscript and stepped to the window, for already the evening shadows were glooming the forest. The song of the whippoorwill was heard in the distance, and a monstrous beetle sped by the window on roaring wings and thundered away out of hearing. THE MANUSCRIPT Before committing the act which, rightly or wrongly, I have resolved on, and appearing before my Maker, for judgment I, James R. Colston, deem it my duty as a journalist to make a statement to the public. My name is, I believe, tolerably well known to the people, as a writer of tragic tales, but the soberest imagination never conceived anything so gloomy as my own life and history. Not in incident, my life has been destitute of adventure and action. But my mental career has been lurid with experiences such as kill and damn. I shall not recount them here. Some of them are written and ready for publication elsewhere. The object of these lines is to explain to whomsoever may be interested that my death is voluntary, my own act. I shall die at twelve o'clock on the night of the 15th of July, a significant anniversary to me, for it was on that day and at that hour that my friend in time and eternity, Charles Breed, performed his vow to me by the same act which his fidelity to our pledge now entails upon me. He took his life in his little house in the Copeton Woods. There was the customary verdict of temporary insanity. Had I testified at that inquest, had I told all I knew, they would have called me mad. I have still a week of life in which to arrange my worldly affairs and prepare for the great change. It is enough, for I have but few affairs, and it is now four years since death became an imperative obligation. I shall bear this writing on my body. The finder will please hand it to the coroner. James R. Colston P.S. Willard Marsh, on this, the fatal fifteenth day of July, I hand you this manuscript to be opened and read under the conditions agreed upon, and at the place which I designate. I forego my intention to keep it on my body to explain the manner of my death, which is not important. It will serve to explain the manner of yours. I am to call for you during the night to receive assurance that you have read the manuscript. You know me well enough to expect me. But, my friend, it will be after twelve o'clock. May God have mercy on our souls. J. R. C. Before the man who was reading this manuscript had finished, the candle had been picked up and lighted. When the reader had done, he quietly thrust the paper against the flame, and, despite the protestations of the others, held it until it was burnt to ashes. The man who did this, and who placidly endured a severe reprimand from the coroner, was a son-in-law of the late Charles Breed. At the inquest nothing could elicit an intelligible account of what the paper contained. FROM THE TIMES Yesterday the commissioners of lunacy committed to the asylum Mr. James R. Colston, a writer of some local reputation, connected with the messenger. It will be remembered that on the evening of the fifteenth instant Mr. Colston was given into custody by one of his fellow lodgers in the Bain House, 
who had observed him acting very suspiciously, baring his throat and wetting a razor, occasionally trying its edge by actually cutting through the skin of his arm, and so forth. On being handed over to the police, the unfortunate man made a desperate resistance, and has ever since been so violent that it has been necessary to keep him in a straitjacket. Most of our esteemed contemporaries' other writers are still at large. Section 2 of In the Midst of Life, Tales of Soldiers and Civilians, 1891. A Tough Tussle one night in the autumn of eighteen sixty one a man sat alone in the heart of a forest in western virginia the region was then and still is one of the wildest on the continent the cheat mountain country there was no lack of people close at hand however within two miles of where the man sat was the now silent camp of a whole federal brigade somewhere about it might be still nearer was a force of the enemy, the numbers unknown. It was this uncertainty as to its numbers and position that accounted for the man's presence in that lonely spot. He was a young officer of a Federal infantry regiment, and his business there was to guard his sleeping companions in the camp against a surprise. He was in command of a detachment of men constituting a picket guard. These men he had stationed just at nightfall in an irregular line, determined by the nature of the ground, several hundred yards in front of where he now sat. The line ran through the forest, among the rocks and laurel thickets, the men fifteen or twenty paces apart, all in concealment and under injunction of strict silence and unremitting vigilance. In four hours, if nothing occurred, they would be relieved by a fresh detachment from the reserve now resting in care of its captain some distance away to the left and rear. Before stationing his men, the young officer of whom we are speaking had pointed out to his two sergeants the spot at which he would be found in case it should be necessary to consult him, or if his presence at the front line should be required. It was a quiet enough spot, the fork of an old wood road, on the two branches of which, prolonging themselves deviously forward in the dim moonlight, the sergeants were themselves stationed, a few paces in rear of the line. If driven sharply back by a sudden onset of the enemy, and pickets are not expected to make a stand after firing, the men would come into the converging roads, and, naturally following them to their point of intersection, could be rallied and formed. In his small way, the young lieutenant was something of a strategist. If Napoleon had planned as intelligently at Waterloo, he would have won the battle and been overthrown later. Second Lieutenant Brainerd Byring was a brave and efficient officer, young and comparatively inexperienced as he was in the business of killing his fellow men. He had enlisted in the very first days of the war as a private, with no military knowledge whatever, had been made first sergeant of his company on account of his education and engaging manner, and had been lucky enough to lose his captain by a Confederate bullet. In the resulting promotions he had got a commission. He had been in several engagements, such as they were, at Philippi, Rich Mountain, Carrick's Ford, and Greenbrier, and had borne himself with such gallantry as to attract the attention of his superior officers. The exhilaration of battle was agreeable to him, but the sight of the dead, with their clay faces, blank eyes, and stiff bodies, which, when not unnaturally shrunken, were unnaturally swollen, had always intolerably affected him. He felt toward them a kind of reasonless antipathy, which was something more than the physical and spiritual repugnance common to us all. Doubtless this feeling was due to his unusually acute sensibilities, his keen sense of the beautiful, which these hideous things outraged. Whatever may have been the cause, 
he could not look upon a dead body without a loathing which had in it an element of resentment. What others have respected as the dignity of death had to him no existence, was altogether unthinkable. Death was a thing to be hated. It was not picturesque, it had no tender and solemn side, a dismal thing, hideous in all its manifestations and suggestions. Lieutenant Byring was a braver man than anybody knew, for nobody knew his horror of that which he was ever ready to encounter. Having posted his men, instructed his sergeants, and retired to his station, he seated himself on a log, and, with senses all alert, began his vigil. For greater ease he loosened his sword-belt, and, taking his heavy revolver from his holster, laid it on the log beside him. He felt very comfortable, though he hardly gave the fact a thought, so intently did he listen for any sound from the front which might have a menacing significance, a shout, a shot, or the footfall of one of his sergeants coming to apprise him of something worth knowing. From the vast invisible ocean of moonlight overhead fell here and there a slender broken stream that seemed to plash against the intercepting branches and trickle to earth, forming small white pools among the clumps of laurel. But these leaks were few and served only to accentuate the blackness of his environment, which his imagination found it easy to people with all manner of unfamiliar shapes, menacing, uncanny, or merely grotesque. He to whom the portentous conspiracy of night and solitude and silence in the heart of a great forest is not an unknown experience, needs not to be told what another world it all is, how even the most commonplace and familiar objects take on another character. The trees group themselves differently. They draw closer together, as if in fear. The very silence has another quality than the silence of the day, and it is full of half-heard whispers, whispers that startle, ghosts of sounds long dead. There are living sounds, too, such as are never heard under other conditions notes of strange night-birds, the cries of small animals in sudden encounters with stealthy foes, or in their dreams a rustling in the dead leaves. It may be the leap of a wood-rat, it may be the footstep of a panther. What caused the breaking of that twig? What the low alarmed twittering in that bush full of birds? There are sounds without a name forms without substance, translations in space of objects which have not been seen to move, movements wherein nothing is observed to change its place. Ah, children of the sunlight and the gaslight, how little you know of the world in which you live! Surrounded at a little distance by armed and watchful friends, Byring felt utterly alone. Yielding himself to the solemn and mysterious spirit of the time and place, he had forgotten the nature of his connection with the visible and audible aspects and phases of the night. The forest was boundless. Men and the habitations of men did not exist. The universe was one primeval mystery of darkness, without form and void, himself the sole dumb questioner of its eternal secret. Absorbed in the thoughts born of this mood, he suffered the time to slip away unnoted. Meantime the infrequent patches of white light lying amongst the undergrowth had undergone changes of size, form, and place. In one of them nearby, just at the roadside, his eye fell upon an object which he had not previously observed. It was almost before his face as he sat. He could have sworn that it had not before been there. It was partly covered in shadow, but he could see that it was a human figure. Instinctively he adjusted the clasp of his sword-belt and laid hold of his pistol. Again 
he was in a world of war, by occupation, an assassin. The figure did not move. Rising, pistol in hand, he approached. The figure lay upon its back, its upper part in shadow, but standing above it and looking down upon the face, he saw that it was a dead body. He shuddered and turned from it with a feeling of sickness and disgust, resumed his seat upon the log, and, forgetting military prudence, struck a match and lit a cigar. In the sudden blackness that followed the extinction of the flame he felt a sense of relief. He could no longer see the object of his aversion. Nevertheless, he kept his eyes set in that direction until it appeared again with growing distinctness. It seemed to have moved a trifle nearer. "'Damn the thing!' he muttered. "'What does it want?' It did not appear to be in need of anything but a soul. Byring turned away his eyes and began humming a tune, but he broke off in the middle of a bar and looked at the dead man. Its presence annoyed him, though he could hardly have had a quieter neighbor. He was conscious, too, of a vague, indefinable feeling which was new to him. It was not fear, but rather a sense of the supernatural, in which he did not at all believe. I have inherited it, he said to himself. I suppose it will require a thousand years, perhaps ten thousand, for humanity to outgrow this feeling. Where and when did it originate? Away back, probably, in what is called the cradle of the human race, the plains of Central Asia. What we inherit as a superstition our barbarous ancestors must have held as a reasonable conviction. Doubtless they believed themselves justified by facts whose nature we cannot even conjecture in thinking a dead body a malign thing, endowed with some strange power of mischief, with perhaps a will and a purpose to exert it. Possibly they had some awful form of religion, of which that was one of the chief doctrines, sedulously taught by their priesthood, just as ours teach the immortality of the soul. As the Aryan moved westward to and through the Caucasus passes and spread over Europe, new conditions of life must have resulted in the formulation of new religions. The old belief in the malevolence of the dead body was lost from the creeds, and even perished from tradition, but it left its heritage of terror, which is transmitted from generation to generation, is as much a part of us as our blood and bones. In following out his thought he had forgotten that which suggested it, but now his eye fell again upon the corpse. The shadow had now altogether uncovered it. He saw the sharp profile, the chin in the air, the whole face, ghastly white in the moonlight. The clothing was gray, the uniform of a Confederate soldier. The coat and waistcoat, unbuttoned, had fallen away on each side, exposing the white shirt. The chest seemed unnaturally prominent, but the abdomen had sunk in, leaving a sharp projection at the line of the lower ribs. The arms were extended, the left knee was thrust upward. The whole posture impressed Byring as having been studied with a view to the horrible. Bah! he exclaimed. He was an actor. He knows how to be dead. He drew away his eyes, directing them resolutely along one of the roads leading to the front, and resumed his philosophizing where he had left off. It may be that our Central Asian ancestors had not the custom of burial. In that case it is easy to understand their fear of the dead, who really were a menace and an evil. They bred pestilences. Children were taught to avoid the places where they lay, and to run away if by inadvertence they came near a corpse. I think, indeed, I'd better go away from this chap. He half rose to do so, then remembered that he told his men in front, and the officer in the rear who was to relieve him, that he could at any time be found in that spot. It was a matter of pride, too. If he abandoned his post, 
he feared they would think he feared the corpse. He was no coward, and he was not going to incur anybody's ridicule. So he again seated himself, and, to prove his courage, looked boldly at the body. The right arm, the one farthest from him, was now in shadow. He could barely see the hand, which he had before observed, lay at the root of a clump of laurel. There had been no change, a fact which gave him a certain comfort, he could not have said why. He did not at once remove his eyes. That which we do not wish to see has a strange fascination, sometimes irresistible. Of the woman who covers her face with her hands and looks between the fingers, let it be said that the wits have dealt with her not altogether justly. Byring suddenly became conscious of a pain in his right hand. He withdrew his eyes from his enemy and looked at it. He was grasping the hilt of his drawn sword so tightly that it hurt him. He observed, too, that he was leaning forward in a strained attitude, crouching like a gladiator ready to spring at the throat of an antagonist. His teeth were clenched, and he was breathing hard. This matter was soon set right, and as his muscles relaxed and he drew a long breath, he felt keenly enough the ludicrousness of the incident. It affected him to laughter. Heavens, what a sound was that! What mindless devil was uttering an unholy glee in mockery of human merriment? He sprang to his feet and looked about him, not recognizing his own laugh. He could no longer conceal from himself the horrible fact of his cowardice. He was thoroughly frightened. He would have run from the spot, but his legs refused their office. They gave way beneath him, and he sat again upon the log, violently trembling. His face was wet, his whole body bathed in a chill perspiration. He could not even cry out. Distinctly he heard behind him a stealthy tread, as of some wild animal, and dared not look over his shoulder. Had the soulless living joined forces with the soulless dead? Was it an animal? Ah, if he could but be assured of that! But by no effort of will could he now unfix his gaze from the face of the dead man. I repeat that Lieutenant Byring was a brave and intelligent man. But what would you have? Shall a man cope, single-handed, with so monstrous an alliance as that of night and solitude and silence and the dead? while an incalculable host of his own ancestors shriek into the ear of his spirit their coward counsel, sing their doleful death-songs in his heart, and disarm his very blood of all its iron. The odds are too great. Courage was not made for such rough use as that. One sole conviction now had the man in possession, that the body had moved. It lay nearer to the edge of its plot of light. There could be no doubt of it. It had also moved its arms, for look, they are both in the shadow. A breath of cold air struck Byring full in the face. The branches of trees above him stirred and moaned. A strongly defined shadow passed across the face of the dead, left it luminous, passed back upon it, and left it half obscured the horrible thing was visibly moving. At that moment a single shot rang out upon the picket line, a lonelier and louder, though more distant shot than ever had been heard by mortal ear. It broke the spell of that enchanted man. It slew the silence and the solitude, dispersed the hindering host from Central Asia, and released his modern manhood. With a cry like that of some great bird pouncing upon its prey, he sprang forward, hot-hearted, for action. Shot after shot now came from the front. There were shoutings and confusion, hoof-beats and desultory cheers. Away to the rear, in the sleeping camp, 
was a singing of bugles and a grumble of drums. Pushing through the thickets on either side the roads came the Federal pickets, in full retreat, firing backward at random as they ran. A straggling group that had followed back one of the roads, as instructed, suddenly sprang away into the bushes as half a hundred horsemen thundered by them, striking wildly with their sabres as they passed. At headlong speed these mounted madmen shot past the spot where Byring had sat, and vanished round an angle of the road, shouting and firing their pistols. A moment later there was a roar of musketry, followed by dropping shots. They had encountered the reserve guard in line, and back they came in dire confusion, with here and there an empty saddle and many a maddened horse, bullet-stung, snorting and plunging with pain. It was all over, an affair of outposts. The line was re-established with fresh men, the roll called, the stragglers were reformed. The Federal commander, with a part of his staff, imperfectly clad, appeared upon the scene, asked a few questions, looked exceedingly wise, and retired. After standing at arms for an hour, the brigade in camp swore a prayer or two and went to bed. Early the next morning a fatigue party, commanded by a captain and accompanied by a surgeon, searched the ground for dead and wounded. At the fork of the road, a little to one side, they found two bodies lying close together, that of a Federal officer and that of a Confederate private. The officer had died of a sword thrust through the heart, but not, apparently, until he had inflicted upon his enemy no fewer than five dreadful wounds. The dead officer lay on his face in a pool of blood, the weapon still in his breast. They turned him on his back, and the surgeon removed it. "'Gad!' said the captain, "'it is Byring,' adding, with a glance at the other, "'they had a tough tussle.' The surgeon was examining the sword. It was that of a line officer of Federal infantry, exactly like the one worn by the captain. It was, in fact, Byring's own. The only other weapon discovered was an undischarged revolver in the dead officer's belt. The surgeon laid down the sword and approached the other body. It was frightfully gashed and stabbed but there was no blood. He took hold of the left foot and tried to straighten the leg. In the effort the body was displaced. The dead do not wish to be moved when comfortable. It protested with a faint, sickening odor. The surgeon looked at the captain. The captain looked at the surgeon. Section 8 of In the Midst of Life, Tales of Soldiers and Civilians, Chickamauga One sunny autumn afternoon a child strayed away from its rude home in a small field and entered a forest unobserved. It was happy in a new sense of freedom from control, happy in the opportunity of exploration and adventure. For this child's spirit, in bodies of its ancestors, had for thousands of years been trained to memorable events of discovery and conquest, victories in battles whose critical moments were centuries, whose victors' camps were cities of hewn stone. From the cradle of its race it had conquered its way through two continents, and passing a great sea had penetrated a third there to be born to war and dominion as a heritage. The child was a boy aged about six years, the son of a poor planter. In his younger manhood the father had been a soldier, had fought against naked savages and followed the flag of his country into the capital of a civilized race to the far south. In the peaceful life of a planter the warrior fire survived. Once kindled, it is never extinguished. 
The man loved military books and pictures, and the boy had understood enough to make himself a wooden sword, though even the eye of his father would hardly have known it for what it was. This weapon he now bore bravely, as became the son of an heroic race, and pausing now and again in the sunny space of the forest, assumed, with some exaggeration, the postures of aggression and defense that he had been taught by the engraver's art. Made reckless by the ease with which he overcame invisible foes attempting to stay his advance, he committed the common enough military error of pushing the pursuit to a dangerous extreme, until he found himself upon the margin of a wide but shallow brook, whose rapid waters barred his direct advance against the flying foe that had crossed with illogical ease. But the intrepid victor was not to be baffled. The spirit of the race which had passed the great sea burned unconquerable in that small breast and would not be denied. Finding a place where some boulders in the bed of the stream lay but a step or a leap apart, he made his way across, and fell again upon the rear guard of his imaginary foe, putting all to the sword. Now that the battle had been won, prudence required that he withdraw to his base of operations. Alas, like many a mightier conqueror, and like one, the mightiest, he could not curb the lust for war nor learn that tempted fate will leave the loftiest star. Advancing from the bank of the creek, he suddenly found himself confronted with a new and more formidable enemy. In the path that he was following sat bolt upright, with ears erect, and paws suspended before it, a rabbit. With a startled cry the child turned and fled. He knew not in what direction calling with inarticulate cries for his mother, weeping, stumbling, his tender skin cruelly torn by brambles, his little heart beating hard with terror, breathless, blind with tears, lost in the forest. Then, for more than an hour, he wandered with erring feet through the tangled undergrowth, till at last, overcome by fatigue, he lay down in a narrow space between two rocks, within a few yards of the stream, and still grasping his toy sword, no longer a weapon, but a companion, sobbed himself to sleep. The wood birds sang merrily above his head. The squirrels, whisking their bravery of tail, ran barking from tree to tree, unconscious of the pity of it, and somewhere far away was a strange muffled thunder, as if the partridges were drumming in celebration of nature's victory over the son of her immemorial enslavers. And back at the little plantation, where white men and black were hastily searching the fields and hedges in alarm, a mother's heart was breaking for her missing child. Hours passed, and then the little sleeper rose to his feet. The chill of the evening was in his limbs, the fear of the gloom in his heart. But he had rested, and he no longer wept. With some blind instinct which impelled to action, he struggled through the undergrowth about him, and came to a more open ground. On his right the brook, to the left a gentle acclivity, studded with infrequent trees. Over all the gathering gloom of twilight. A thin, ghostly mist rose along the water. It frightened and repelled him. Instead of recrossing in the direction whence he had come, he turned his back upon it and went forward toward the dark, enclosing wood. Suddenly he saw before him a strange moving object, which he took to be some large animal. A, a dog, a pig, he could not name it. Perhaps it was a bear. He had seen pictures of bears, but knew of nothing to their discredit, and had vaguely wished to meet one. But something in form or movement of this object, 
something in the awkwardness of its approach, told him that it was not a bear, and curiosity was stayed by fear. He stood still, and as it came slowly on, gained courage every moment, for he saw that at least it had not the long menacing ears of the rabbit. Possibly his impressionable mind was half-conscious of something familiar in its shambling, awkward gait. Before it had approached near enough to resolve his doubts, he saw that it was followed by another and another. To right and to left were many more. The whole open space about him was alive with them, all moving toward the brook. They were men. They crept upon their hands and knees. They used their hands only, dragging their legs. They used their knees only, their arms hanging idle at their sides. They strove to rise to their feet, but fell prone in the attempt. They did nothing naturally, and nothing alike, save only to advance foot by foot in the same direction. Singly, in pairs and in little groups, they came on through the gloom, some halting now and again, while others crept slowly past them, then resuming their movement. They came by dozens and by hundreds, as far on either hand as one could see in the deepening gloom they extended, and the black wood behind them appeared to be inexhaustible. The very ground seemed in motion toward the creek. Occasionally one who had paused did not again go on, but lay motionless. He was dead. Some pausing made strange gestures with their hands, erected their arms, and lowered them again, clasped their heads, spread their palms upward, as men are sometimes seen to do in public prayer. Not all of this did the child note. It is what would have been noted by an elder observer. He saw little but that these were men, yet crept like babes. Being men, they were not terrible, though unfamiliarly clad. He moved among them freely, going from one to another and peering into their faces with childish curiosity. All their faces were singularly white and many were streaked and gouted with red. Something in this, something too perhaps in their grotesque attitudes and movements, reminded him of the painted clown whom he had seen last summer in the circus, and he laughed as he watched them. But on and ever on they crept, these maimed and bleeding men, as heedless as he of the dramatic contrast between his laughter and their own ghastly gravity. To him it was a merry spectacle. He had seen his father's negroes creep upon their hands and knees for his amusement, had ridden them too, so making believe they were his horses. He now approached one of these crawling figures from behind, and with an agile movement mounted it astride. The man sank upon his breast, recovered, flung the small boy fiercely to the ground as an unbroken colt might have done, then turned upon him a face that lacked a lower jaw. From the upper teeth to the throat was a great red gap fringed with hanging shreds of flesh and splinters of bone. The unnatural prominence of nose, the absence of chin, the fierce eyes, gave this man the appearance of a great bird of prey, crimsoned in throat and breast by the blood of its quarry. The man rose to his knees, the child to his feet. The man shook his fist at the child. The child, terrified at last, ran to a tree nearby got upon the farther side of it, and took a more serious view of the situation. And so the clumsy multitude dragged itself slowly and painfully along in hideous pantomime, moved forward down the slope like a swarm of great black beetles, with never a sound of going, 
in silence profound, absolute. Instead of darkening, the haunted landscape began to brighten. Through the belt of trees beyond the brook shone a strange red light, the trunks and branches of the trees making a black lacework against it. It struck the creeping figures and gave them monstrous shadows, which caricatured their movements on the lit grass. It fell upon their faces, touching their whiteness with a ruddy tinge, accentuating the stains with which so many of them were freaked and maculated. It sparkled on buttons and bits of metal in their clothing. Instinctively the child turned toward the growing splendor and moved down the slope with his horrible companions. In a few moments had passed the foremost of the throng, not much of a feat considering his advantages. He placed himself in the lead, his wooden sword still in hand, and solemnly directed the march, conforming his pace to theirs, and occasionally turning as if to see that his forces did not straggle. Surely such a leader never before had such a following. Scattered about among the ground now slowly narrowing by the encroachment of this awful march to water, were certain articles to which, in the leader's mind, were coupled no significant associations, an occasional blanket tightly rolled lengthwise, doubled, and the ends bound together with a string a heavy knapsack here, and there a broken rifle, such things, in short, as are found in the rear of retreating troops, the spoor of men flying from their hunters. Everywhere near the creek, which here had a margin of lowland, the earth was trodden into mud by the feet of men and horses. An observer of better experience in the use of his eyes would have noticed that these footprints pointed in both directions. The ground had been twice passed over, in advance and in retreat. A few hours before, these desperate, stricken men, with their more fortunate and now distant comrades, had penetrated the forest in thousands. Their successive battalions, breaking into swarms and reforming in lines, had passed the child on every side, had almost trodden on him as he slept. The rustle and murmur of their march had not awakened him. Almost within a stone's throw of where he lay they had fought a battle. But all unheard by him were the roar of the musketry, the shock of the cannon, the thunder of the captains, and the shouting. He had slept through it all grasping his little wooden sword with perhaps a tighter clutch in unconscious sympathy with his martial environment, but as heedless of the grandeur of the struggle as the dead who had died to make the glory. The fire beyond the belt of woods on the farther side of the creek, reflected to earth from the canopy of its own smoke, was now suffusing the whole landscape. It transformed the sinuous line of mist to the vapor of gold. The water gleamed with dashes of red, and red, too, were many of the stones protruding above the surface. But that was blood. The less desperately wounded had stained them in crossing. On them, too, the child now crossed with eager steps. He was going to the fire. As he stood upon the farther bank, he turned about to look at the companions of his march. The advance was arriving at the creek. The stronger had already drawn themselves to the brink and plunged their faces into the flood. Three or four who lay without motion appeared to have no heads. At this the child's eyes expanded with wonder. Even his hospitable understanding could not accept a phenomenon implying such vitality as that. After slaking their thirst, these men had not had the strength to back away from the water, nor to keep their heads above it. They were drowned. In rear of these, the open spaces of the forest, 
showed the leader as many formless figures of his grim command as at first, but not nearly so many were in motion. He waved his cap for their encouragement and smilingly pointed with his weapon in the direction of the guiding light, a pillar of fire to this strange exodus. Confident of the fidelity of his forces, he now entered the belt of woods, passed through it easily in the red illumination, climbed a fence, ran across a field, turning now and again to coquette with his responsive shadow, and so approached the blazing ruin of a dwelling. Desolation everywhere. In all the wide glare not a living thing was visible. He cared nothing for that. The spectacle pleased, and he danced with glee in imitation of the wavering flames. He ran about, collecting fuel, but every object that he found was too heavy for him to cast in from the distance to which the heat limited his approach. In despair he flung in his sword, a surrender to the superior forces of nature. His military career was at an end. Shifting his position, his eyes fell upon some outbuildings which had an oddly familiar appearance, as if he had dreamed of them. He stood considering them with wonder, when suddenly the entire plantation, with its enclosing forest, seemed to turn as if upon a pivot. His little world swung half around. The points of the compass were reversed. He recognized the blazing building as his own home. For a moment he stood stupefied by the power of the revelation, then ran with stumbling feet, making a half-circuit of the ruin. There, conspicuous in the light of the conflagration, lay the dead body of a woman, the white face turned upward, the hands thrown out and clutched full of grass the clothing deranged, the long dark hair in tangles and full of clotted blood. The greater part of the forehead was torn away, and from the jagged hole the brain protruded, overflowing the temple, a frothy mass of gray, crowned with clusters of crimson bubbles, the work of a shell. The child moved his little hands, making wild, uncertain gestures. He uttered a series of inarticulate and indescribable cries, something between the chattering of an ape and the gobbling of a turkey, a startling, soulless, unholy sound, the language of a devil. The child was a deaf-mute. Then he stood motionless, with quivering lips, looking down upon the wreck. End of Section 8